Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, O oh Lord, let it prove to be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength, and Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. And this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. We pray, let us all say together, amen. Amen. All right, all right, all right, man. This is our, our Bible study on today. Amen. And uh, into our theme for the month has been what? God help me when I'm hurting. I mean, I hope you've been enjoying the messages on pain. And uh, we kind of deal with those things. We dealt with tears on Sunday. But you know, today we want to talk about uh, <laughs> what to do when God messes up your plans. What to do when God messes up your plans. Hmm. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he says what? I got plans for you. Declares the Lord. He says plans for welfare and not for calamity. And to give you a future and to give you a hope. God says, I have plans for you. Amen. Now, we live in a world, it's the four Ds of living in the world that we live living in today. Uh, we live in a world that's filled with disappointment. We live in a world that's filled with despair. Uh, people don't have hope in life. We live in a world that's filled with dismay. Things are just not working the way we want it to work. We live in a world that's filled with discouragement. And so I think those four Ds are very prevalent in the world that we live in today. In fact, the Bible reminds us that for many people who claim to be in the kingdom of God, they're living with these four Ds. They're living in these four Ds. You know, they, they come to church or whatever, uh, but they, they live a life of disappointment. They live a life of despair. They live a life of dismay. They live a life of discouragement. And why is that happening among kingdom people? I think the Bible describes it in two passages of Scripture in Proverbs 14 and 12, there it is. There is a way <laughs> which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And, and what does it mean by the way of death? I mean, it doesn't mean that you're not going to cease to exist. He doesn't mean by that. Death in this context means separated from God. And so that which is separated from God has no life in it. That which has no life in it is not fruitful, it's not productive. It decays with age. And so each of us in our lives, as we get older, if God is in our life, it ought to grow. You ought to become more fruitful. You ought to become more beneficial. You know, and every round ought to go higher and higher in your life. Life without God, what's going to happen? As you get older, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And that's what happened with a lot of marriages and a lot of relationships. They, you know, they are without God. And as they get older, they get worse. They decay. They're not fruitful. I mean, they're, they're not beneficial. They're not a blessing in your life. Amen. And because we got a way that seems right to us. Amen. And this is why... You know, the foundation of our faith is marriage, but it's the, it's the one institution that even the people who in the kingdom don't, do, don't get right because of that scripture right there. <laughs> and that's why statistics says that 89% of the people who are married, even in the church, are not happy. They're not fulfilled. Because there is a way that'll seem right to a man. So you can believe the word. You can even say amen to the will. But the reason why it ain't working because you won't surrender to the way. And that's what's happening. And Proverbs, you know, 16, 25, turn around and say the same thing. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of what is also what the way of death. Because sometimes life just don't go according to plan. Now, how many of you in here, has God ever messed up your plan? Okay. <laughs> I know I had a different plan for my life. I had a different plan for my life. I never knew I would be a preacher. I never knew I would be pastor in the church. And I never knew that I'd be pastor in the church in the bottom. I never knew. 
I'll be pastor of the church on the East Boundary and Forsyth Street. Never knew that, you know. He messed up mine, and I'm sure he's messed up a lot of yours as well. Now, every messed up plan is not God's fault. And every messed up plan is not God's plan. Some plans are messed up for three reasons. Some are messed up because of trials. And James 1 and 2 talks about what? Kind of all joy when you fall into different what? Trials. Some plans are messed up because we don't know how to manage a trial. We don't know. I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. Amen. So when does the trial become a test, a temptation? A trial becomes a temptation when it reveals your weaknesses. Because temptations always reveal what we're weak in. That's why it's called a temptation. If you're not weak in it, it's not a temptation. See, liquor is not a temptation to me because it's not one of my weaknesses. So when the enemy gets ready to tempt me, he tempts me in a weak area of my life. And that's for each and every one of us, amen? That's in each and every one of us. So here it is, man, here it is. You got to understand, uh, sometimes it's called by trial. Sometimes it's called by trauma. Plans can change in your life, First Peter 4.12. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which will come upon you by your testing. As though some strange things were happening to you. Sometimes trauma can change plans. Your trauma could come in the area of sickness. You can have a death plan for your life, and bam, bam, you find out a medical diagnosis, and it changes the whole plans. Sometimes it could come through money, loss of job. Some trauma in your life can also cause plans to be changed. It happens to all of us. I don't care who you are. Don't blame God, okay? Sometimes things are caused by trauma. Sometimes plans are, uh, are, are changed because the circumstances change in our life. Circumstances change in our life. People die, or somebody leave you, or somebody you thought was going to be your friend betrayed you. Uh, some job you thought was going to be your career didn't work out. So it happens that way, amen? And these things happen because we live in a broken world. We live in a messy world where bad things will happen to undeserving people as well as bad things will happen uh, to deserving people. I don't like to say, I don't like to hear people say, you know, why does God let bad things happen to good people? I ain't never met no good person. Because according to the scripture, Nobody good, but is it true? Okay, all right. I, I, I never met a good person. Now, it's just some things that happen to you, you deserve it. It's the consequences of something you're doing. Uh, some things happen to you that you really don't deserve. It. We talked about Job yesterday. We talked about what? Um, misery. You know, he got a lot of stuff happening to him he really didn't deserve. You know what I'm saying? So you got to read it. John 8, the blind man. And the question was asked, why was this man born blind? You know, did he, did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus said, neither one. He didn't really deserve to be blind, but God allowed it to happen. Why? Because I knew I was coming to bring his sight. Hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, so one of the lessons that we learn in life is that plans are messed up. And why does God allow our plans to be messed up? I'm going to give you some principles I want you to kind of write down, amen. I want you to write down the word attention. Sometimes God messes up our plan because he wants to get our attention. He messes up our plan because he has a better plan in mind and he can't share it with you because he can't get your attention. Sometimes God messes up our plans because he's saying, you need to focus more on me. Hey, look at Psalm 81 and 8. The Bible says hear. Every time I hear that word hear in the Bible, I'm always moved by that word. Yeah? Because hearing comes with more than listening. Hearing comes with responding. 
You have not heard God unless you're responding to God. Amen. So a lot of you are listening, but you're not hearing. Because God says you're not responding. You're not responding. If I call your name five times and you're looking right at me and you don't say nothing, then I'm going to ask you, did you hit me? Because if you had heard me, you would have responded. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? And so this is the thing that God is saying when he said here. He says what? Oh, my people, I would admonish you. I would admonish you. What do you want to admonish me? It means to warn. He said, I'm warning you, Israel, if you won't listen to me. I'm warning you if you won't listen to me. And so oftentimes God don't get our attention because we're too busy. God doesn't get our attention because we're too caught up in the things to listen to him. He wants our attention because he loves us. He wants our attention because he wants to spare us a lot of pain. He wants our attention. He wants to spare us some experiences in life that we don't need to really experience. God is saying, if you let me have your attention, there are three E's I'm going to do in your life. There are three E's I'm going to do in your life. When God gets your attention, three things he's going to do in your life. Number one, I'm going to make your life easier. Go to Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Now, he didn't say you were going to have difficulties because we live in a broken world. He told his disciples when they followed him, he said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have some difficulties because it come with being in the broken world. This is not heaven. The only way we're going to be problem free is when we're not here. But you're going to have those kind of things happen in your life. But I will make it easier for you. Go to Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Oh, my God. He said, if you yoke up with me. Yoke was the term that they used with oxen. They would take uh, an old ox and put a young ox. And they were, you ever seen those little wooden bars they would put in between them? That means they yoke them together. That means that they are pulling in the same direction. But what happened is the young ox will follow the direction of the old ox because the old ox knows the road and he knows the way. He's been that way before. So he knows how to pull. He knows what's going to make the load flip. He knows what potholes to avoid that a young ox don't do. If he'd been by himself, he'd have broke his leg or he'd have lost the load. But since he's yoked up with an old experienced ox that knows the road and knows the way, he just simply follow and be pulled in the direction of that ox. Jesus says, if you just yoke up with me. He said, because the road you're trying to travel in, I know that road. And the way you're trying to go in, I know that way. And I know how to pull you to the right. And pull you to the left. To make sure you don't spill your load. In other words, the road is still rocky, but I just make it a lot easier. Somebody ought to praise God for that. Amen. And that's why people look at you and wonder how you're going through all the things you're going through and ain't lost your mind. How you going through all the things you're going through and you act like nothing is really wrong with you it's because of who I'm yoked with. I got somebody yoked with and he knows how to pull me over here and he pulled me over there. Are y'all hear what I'm talking about? He just makes the road a lot easier. I'm gentle and humble in your heart. And the Bible said, and you'll find rest. Not for your body, but for your soul. In other words, what do you mean by rest for your soul? He said, I'll put your mind at ease. Are y'all hear what I'm talking about? Amen. And when your mind is right, your feelings are right. And when your feelings are right, you make better choices. The Bible said, hey, what you do with God, Philippians 4, 6, in everything by prayer and thanksgiving. You let your request be made known unto God. And then what we would do? And the peace of God. Oh, my God. He didn't say, I get rid of your situation. He didn't say, I give you the peace that will guard your mind and guard your heart. Are y'all hear what I'm talking about? And the Bible uses a term about losing heart. You ever see that in the scripture? You ever see the word faint? Anybody see the word faint in the King James? But really, that word faint means to don't lose heart. 
Lose heart means simply this. It means don't act badly. Lord, please, don't let the situation in my life make me act badly. <laughs> Amen. That's what I mean by don't faint. Man ought to always pray. Why? So he can stop himself from acting badly. Amen. People say, I, I never would have prayed the lottery, but I got, to, I got to pay the rent. I got to pay my rent, you know, and uh, man, my car payment behind. So what happened? You're using your situation to make you act badly. <laughs> and so this is what God is telling you not to do. So number one, he makes your life easier. Here's number two. He makes your life more enjoyable. <laughs> Guess I make your life more enjoyable. 1 Timothy 6, 17, I, that's one of my favorite verses here. He says, instruct those who are rich in this, in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but to seek it on God, who riches surprise us with all things. To do what? To enjoy. God says, hey, if you yoke up with me, I give you things that you can enjoy. And a lot of people, man, you know, they got the house, they got the cars, they got all of that stuff, and they're still miserable. They don't know how to enjoy it. They don't know how to enjoy it because they got it without God. And when you get it without God, the Bible says you won't enjoy it. Yeah? You get a man without God, guarantee you will not enjoy it. You get a woman without God, guarantee Amen. She's beautiful. And when you get her in the house, you ain't going to enjoy her. Because God said, I give you, whatever I give you, I give you all things for you to be able what, to be able to enjoy them. And here's the last thing that God does when you yoke up with him. He will enlighten you. Go to Joshua 1.8. This is one of my favorite scriptures. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. You know what prosperity is? Being in the will of God. That's all it is. It ain't got nothing to do whether you drive a Mercedes or whether you live in a trailer. It ain't got nothing to do, amen? <laughs> I could be a very prosperous man driving a Chevrolet. I'm a prosperous man driving a Hyundai. And prosperity don't mean I'm driving a Rolls Royce. I mean, I'll drive whatever God gives me. Whatever's in the will of God, that's what I enjoy. That's prosperity, people. That's what prosperity. And that's what makes you successful. Your success is based on where you are with God. It's the position you are with God. People who are righteous are always successful. Righteousness means right position. That means you're in the right position with God. And the Bible says he will do all of these things for you. Amen? Now, here's the thing I want you to write down. This is very important when it comes to your plans. God wants to build your character, not your comfort. God wants to build your character, but not your comfort. And that's why he often afflicts the comfortable <laughs> as well as comforting the afflicted. Because God is more concerned about your character. God is more concerned about your holiness than he is concerned about your happiness. Now, why is God so hard on this, man? Why, why is God so hard on this? Because I really believe uh, that a lot of kingdom people don't understand character. I was really upset with God when I started preaching. I started preaching, and I came out of school, and I thought God was going to put me in this mega church. I'm so well trained. And God sent me to rural churches. First 35 people, then 17 people, then 10 people, 
then seven people. And for eight years, he kept me in those places. And my mentor said something to me, and it really stuck with me. He said, son, you got great gifts, but the problem is you will never be successful because you don't have character. God put you there to develop your character. Because your gift will take you where your character can't keep you. Are y'all hear what I'm talking about? So God wants to work on your character. So character is important, but the problem is do you understand character? So pastor, what is character? What is character? What is character? What is character? Well, Genesis 126. What is the first gift God gave to man? Anybody know? What is the first gift God gave to man? What is the first gift God gave to man? No. The first gift God gave to man was image. <laughs> That's the first gift. Now, what is the word image means? The word image in the Hebrew means character. Notice this now. Before he gave him dominion, <laughs> before he gave him power, before he gave him rule, before he gave him authority, he gave him image. Because God, he knew that he would not be able to function in power or authority without image, without character. Hmm. Now, what is that? It's amazing to me. You ever notice this? What, I mean, what is the word, uh, you know, character really means? Hmm. I'm going to give you four definitions of characters. The word character, in a nutshell, means one. You are a character. Your character is a reflection of your oneness. And why does God associate himself with one? Because he never changes. Character you have character when you don't change. This is why our alphabets are called characters. Why is the alphabet called a character? Because A is always A. B is always B. C is always A. See, they don't change. Oh, my God. Why do you think your numbers are called characters? Numbers are called characters because one is always one. Two is always two. The numbers do not change. What should we be preaching, AJ? We preach principles. Why do you preach principles, Pastor? Because principles don't change. So when you preach the Bible, you look for principles. Because the principles never change. There's a principle called gravity. Guess what? You can be holy as you want to be, full of anointing of the Spirit, or just all, you read the Bible every day, you just fast and you pray. Okay, that's wonderful. But if you jump off this building, there's a principle called character, a, a principle that's called gravity, and that gravity is not going to change because principles do not what? They do not change. This is why God defines himself in character, he calls himself one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. Why? I change not. And God wants to build your character, but your character ought to reflect his image. 
and your private reflection is damaged. Why does marriages don't work? Marriages don't work because they violate character. They don't have character. That's why they don't work. See, the Bible said the two become what? One. One. Flesh. And people don't think God is talking about sex. He's not talking about sex. What God is talking about, what is your flesh? It's what you feel, what you think, and what you believe. And so God says, what is the marriage? It's two people who become one in their character and what they think and what they feel and what they believe. If you're not thinking the same things about money in your marriage, then your marriage don't have any character. If you're not thinking the same things about your spirituality in your marriage, then your marriage has no character. If you're not thinking the same things about your goals in marriage, then your marriage don't have any character. And what it is that destroyed it is the lack of character. <laughs> because there's a thing about character, see. Character, I hope we're not boring y'all. Character is what we trust. I don't trust you because you don't have no character. You keep changing. <laughs> A lot of people don't go to church because you go. Because when they come home, you change. You're shouting all over the church. You're singing yourself happy. But your husband don't come. Why he don't come? Because he knows when you get back to the house. Hmm. It's like a character. Children don't want to go to church. They don't want to go to church. You raise them up in church. Then they leave church. You know why they leave church? Because they saw their mama and daddy had no character. They was one thing in church. And they go home. And they know the liquor you're drinking and the, and the cigarettes you're smoking and the horn around that you're doing. So what destroyed that relationship is character. So let me give you four, four definitions of character. Because this, this whole thing God is messing up your plans because he's trying to build your character. He's trying to build your character. When what you say, what you do, and how you act is the same. Hmm. Character number one. It's a commitment to a set of values that you won't compromise. Character is a commitment to a set of values that you won't compromise. Now, what makes me compromise is because I'm in something I don't value. And people come up, this is why, I'm saying, this is why, this is why uh, preachers can't be politicians. They can't be politicians, you know why? Because politicians have to compromise principles for popularity. If I was a politician, man, I, I wouldn't be a very good one because when I was a politician, I would have to stand up and say, what does say the Lord? Politicians can't do that. You have to compromise all of that. They have no character. And that's why they hire what is called image consultants. And what is an image consultant? An image consultant is somebody you hire to create a person that you ain't. And that's why you're looking at these guys. Oh, he's so romantic. Oh, he's so this. And then when you get them home, you understand. It was just an image. A commitment to a set of values. People will not compromise what they really value. 
if they really value it, they will not compromise it. That's character. There are some things in my life I'm not going to compromise it because of what I value. Here's the second good definition of character. Character is a set of standards that you would not negotiate. It's a set of standards that you would not negotiate. When I bring a, a message to you, I really don't care less how you feel about it when I bring a message to you. I don't care less whether you think it's too long or whether you think it's too short. I have a standard that I preach. And I would not compromise that for you. So if I think you, you, you well, Pastor Blunt preaches too long, then leave. I mean, I mean, nobody makes you stay. You feel like you done had enough. Amen. You walk on out the door. But Pastor, when are you going to get through? When I get through. <laughs> I preach as long as he tell me. When he said, that's enough, then I'm done. When he just said, no, keep going. I keep going. You don't think I got other things I want to do? I got other things I like to do. Amen. Do you think that sometimes I get tired of listening to myself? Yes, I do. But I got to do what he tells me to do. Why? Because there's a standard. And you will not negotiate your standard. Let me tell you a sign I hate. I hate this sign. And I never trust nobody who advertises their virtue. I don't like people who advertise their virtue. I would never buy a car for somebody who said, Honest Charlie. If he got to advertise his virtue. <laughs> How many of you ever heard people say, Honesty is the best policy? That is not a kingdom statement. Because if you said honesty is the best policy, you act like there's another policy. There ain't no other policy. For us, honesty is the only policy. That's the standard. That's why we don't use terms in this church. And y'all stop calling Sister Blount first lady. It, there's no such thing as the first lady in the church. If you got a first, there's got to be a second. Well, who's the second lady? Who's the third lady? Who's the fourth lady? So you got that from the White House. The White House calls the president's wife the first lady. You know why? Because there's a vice president and he has a lady. So she's the second lady. So there would be a need to call her the first lady if she's the only one. There's no need to call her this, this is my first child and that's the only child you got. That's your only child. Character is a set of standards that you will not negotiate. You will not negotiate. You will not negotiate. Here's the third definition of character. Character is a self-imposed discipline. It's a self-imposed discipline. You know, but nobody has to make you do something. When you've got character on a job, you don't need supervision. You don't need nobody watching over you. You have a self-imposed discipline. Discipline. I don't punch a clock here, Grady. You know I don't have anybody who has to tell me that, you know, you need to be at church in the morning. There's a self imposed discipline that God wants you to have. That's your character. You knew you got that job, that they wanted you there at 7 o'clock in the morning and, to, and, and, and get off at 3 o'clock. You already knew that. When you took the job, then why are you rolling up in there at 715? It's because you got no character. You knew they pay you 
from 7 o'clock to 3 o'clock. What do they pay you for? They pay you for the job that they ordered you to do. Then why are you spending 45 minutes on the phone lying that you're doing church uh, uh, office business when you really conducted personal business on company time? Why are you doing that? Because you have no character. Character is self-imposed discipline. Character is when you lock yourself up in the prison of your own conviction. I'm locked up in the prison of my own conviction. Most of the time, I'm the last one to leave this church at night. I said, why are you here so late? Because of self-imposed discipline. Hmm. Here's the fourth definition of character. Is it my beat here today? Character is a constant effort to integrate three areas of your life. Your words, your deeds, your actions. To integrate means they become as one. You're one. You're one. Let me just go a little bit further when I said your actions. It's really your attitude. Your words, your attitude, your actions are one. So if I tell you I love you, it's because it's in my attitude towards you. And it's in the way I treat you. They are one. If I don't care for you, I ain't going to tell you I love you. Because at that time, they're not integrated. That's where you get the word integrity from. Integrity means that there is an integration between what I say, what my attitude is, and what I do. That's the benchmark for integrity. Integrity means to be one with yourself. It doesn't matter what other people say about you. You need to know you are one with yourself. that you don't live for people's opinions. You don't live for people's approval. Because if you live for people's approval, you will die from their rejection. <laughs> only important thing in my life is I know who I am. The only important thing in my life is that God knows who I am. And then the rest of y'all, whatever y'all feel is all right. <laughs> I mean, you have integrity, and people, because people, you know, they watch to see whether you have integrity. The two things I learned about leadership. And I know next month is Pastor's Month. And I'm going to talk a lot about leadership, so y'all get ready for this. But it's two things I learned about leadership. You know what they I learned about leadership? That everybody in here is a leader. Well, Pastor, no, some people are not leaders. Yeah, everybody is a leader. But you're not a leader over people. <laughs> you know what you're a leader over? You're a leader over your gift. <laughs> God never created you to lead people. He wants you to be a leader over your gift. So once you discover your gift, you are a leader over your gift. And people become attracted to your gift. People will follow you, don't even like you. They just like your gift. People want you, don't even know you. They are attracted what? To your gift. I 
And how do you lead people? You lead people by your life. Not by your words. What do I mean by leading people by your life? It doesn't mean you're going to live a perfect life. Because nobody's going to live a perfect life. But you want to be able to live a life that people know how God handles adversity as well as how God handles success. How God handles defeat as well as how God handles victory. See, people think that the only example we need to set the people is victory. No, we need to accept Set the example of how God helps you through defeat. Because most people are going through defeat. Most people are going through failure. So if you just all victory, they can even identify with you. Hmm. I think the greatest faith we can have in our life is not the faith to be healed. I think the greatest faith we can have in our life is the faith to stay sick. For what if God decides? And that was the faith the Hebrew boys had, didn't they? What they had? They said, okay, now listen, look at King, King, King. You tripping. We ain't bowing down to no image. Now you can throw us in this fire. <laughs> But we know one thing, the God we serve is able to deliver us. But if not, will you serve God in the if not? Job was such a great man not because of how much he trusted God. Job was a great man because God trusted him. And there's some issues that God is going to allow to happen in your life because he trusts you. And we say, oh, man, why did God let this happen to me? He said, I can trust you with it and know you're going to stay with me. Because guess what? God gets glory through evil rather than good. That's why God permits evil. If God did not permit evil, he wouldn't get glory. The power of God is his ability to bring good out of evil. If we were all good, we would get the glory. The glory of God is look what he did with something that's evil. And he was able to bring good out of evil. This is why he said, let me tell you something. All things going to work together for good. To those that love me. Those who are called according to his purpose. And you say, why did God allow so much evil in the world? <laughs> because a lot of us wouldn't know he's God without his presence. Your experiences will come more with God in your downfall than in your up. Do I have some real believers here who can testify? <laughs> my greatest experience came with God when I was broke and I didn't have nothing and I didn't know where I was going to live and I didn't know what I was going to do and I trusted him and I began to see his working in my home that's why Paul said I've learned in whatever state I am I've learned to find contentment in that state that means I've learned to accept the presence of God no matter what situation that I'm in. So it doesn't change my relationship with him. That's why I can praise him when I'm broke and I can praise him when I got money. I can praise him when I'm up and when I can praise him when I'm down because he told me that he would never leave me nor he would ever forsake me and he would be with me until the end of the age. So I'm trusting that relationship. When the Bible tells us to be holy, you know what the root word for holiness is? One. It says, be holy because I am holy. Be one because I am one. Y'all hear what I'm telling you? So sometimes God messes up your plans. 
Because he's trying to get your attention. Because he's trying to build your character. So that what you do and how you act and your attitude would be the same. Does that make any sense? Now, there, let me just leave you alone. I know I stayed a lot of time on, on, on character. You know, man, you got to <laughs> you gotta work on that. I mean, God's still working on me. I, I, you know God's still working on you. Like he's working on you, amen? Even with the people you don't like, you want to have the right attitude toward them. You want to have the right attitude toward them. Why? Because God told me to love you. So I can tell you I love you. It ain't got nothing to do with how you act and how you behaving. But I'm going to have the right attitude toward you. You can't let people do that. There are three ways God tests character. Number one, power. <laughs> let God give you a little bit of power, then you see what kind of character you have. A little bit of power, amen. Lord knows, man, when you get all your bills paid, get all the money you want, now you see how much character you really have. Let me give you a little power. Some of y'all were nice folks till you got a position. You got a little title on your name, and it messed up your character. I mean, some, some of y'all were nice folk when y'all lived in the project. Now you got a, another address, and now you're saying, I can't come down there around them people. <laughs> and you were raised down there. Amen? A little bit of power, man, messes up folk, man. They messes up folk. It reveals your character. It reveals what kind of person. Are you going to be the same person you were when you were unemployed and broke and on the street? Will you still be the same person that God done took you off the, your, your heels and put you in some wheels and took you out the sticks and put you in some bricks? Will you still be the same person? I go down to Millen, to my hometown down in Millen, you know, down to Millen, and, uh, and I appreciate them respecting me. They call me Reb, and you know, you know, you know, you know. I don't just call me Bruce. I'm still Bruce. I'm saying Bruce. I'm still Bruce. I don't put on no airs. I don't tell people I'm from a big town, like some people want to know. Because y'all don't know where Millen at. Y'all, oh, I'm from Augusta. No, I'm not from Augusta. Even though I've lived here, I've lived here long, longer than I lived in Millen. But I'm from Millen. Now, you, you may ride through there and get depressed, but I'm still from Millen. When I left Millen, they didn't have a McDonald's. When I left Millen, they didn't have a Popeye. When I left Millen, they didn't have a Hutter House. When I left Millen, they didn't have a pizza place. When I left Millen, all we had was a Dairy Queen. Right there on Highway 25, before you cross the bridge, used to be a Dairy Queen sitting right there on the left. And we had to go to the side, it wasn't at the end. But now you go through Miller, man, you're going to go to Popeye's, McDonald's. Hey, man, Miller done moved up, man, moved up. Now, just don't go any further past that now. You better stay on 25. But here's the thing I'm trying to tell you, man. Power tests you. Here's the second reason that God tests your character. It's not just with power. He tests it with money. We get a little bit of power, we get a little bit of money. And some of y'all real character comes out. Hmm. Now I grew up I grew up in a I grew up in a in a family and we lived on a little area of Millen called Hun Jones. They call it I don't know why they called it that, but we lived off Winthrop Avenue. We lived where the hospital in Millen is. And we were we weren't poor, we were poor. But nobody knew it because that's the way everybody lived. See, I grew up when you didn't have to worry about what you're going to wear on church on Sunday. You wore the same thing until 
Easter. And you got your new Easter outfit. Come on, some of y'all come back with me. Y'all y'all know. <laughs> You went to school, and when you came back from school, you took off them school clothes. See, that, that's where I come from. I come from a place during the summer, you didn't even wear shoes. You walked barefoot everywhere you went. But money shouldn't change you. It shouldn't change your character. So I have to remind them, you can still call me Bruce, it's okay. You can still call me Bruce. You know, Pastor Blunt, Pastor's what I do. It ain't who I am, so you can still call me by my name. That's my name. I don't want to be disrespectful. Well, just don't act disrespectful. We'll be all right. Because <laughs> you act disrespectful, it ain't going to be Pastor hurting you. It's going to be Bruce hurting you. The third reason that God tests our character is called temptation. He tests our character when we are tempted. Because temptation will reveal, always reveal your weakness. It's always reveal what you're weak in. And God will always test you in that area. He allowed those tests to happen. So I want you to know, number one, that God has what? He wants to get our attention. Why? Because he wants to build our character. And that's why he messes up your plans. That's why he messes up your plans. Now, I want to briefly go through this right quickly. Anybody learn something? Anybody learn something? Okay. I want you to understand that God has a different plan. God has a different plan. He does, man. He has a different plan. All of us are made for a purpose, but only God knows what it is. When God messes up our plans because he's trying to get us back with his purpose for our life. And this is why he messes it up. He messes it up because this is outside of your purpose. And that's why Jeremiah said that God has an expected end. He'll give you that kind of future. Expected end is translated hope. God says, I have a hope for you. There's some things you need to learn about God's plans. And this is what I've learned right quickly. And we're going to get out of here because I'm hungry. Okay. I learned this about God. His plans are bigger than your plans. God's plans are always bigger than your plans. It's always bigger than your plans. You know what a, a godly dream is? A godly dream is always bigger than you can accomplish. It's always bigger than what you can accomplish. And so God, you know, when God gives you a godly dream, nobody can accomplish it but him. So it's a God, it's bigger. It's always bigger. It's always bigger. And you know what I know how you know something is a godly dream? Because the godly dream will never be about yourself. It'll always be about what God wants to do with someone else. If God wants to make your life attractive, your life so attractive. You know why? It's like a tree. The fruit that's on the tree, the tree never brings you the fruit. The fruit just look attractive enough and folk come and pick it. That's why the Bible says your gift will make room for you. That you don't have to go around and say, man, when you going to give me a shot? You know, I hate when preachers call me and tell me that, ask me something like that. When you going to let me preach? Really? Like, your preaching is left up to me. It's not left up to me. It's left up to God. If God wants you to preach a greater year in Zion, he'll put it in my heart, and God puts it in my heart, and I'll tell you about it. And I feel like when a preacher invites me to preach somewhere, it's because what? God spoke to him, and God says, Blunt is the man. He's the man you need to call. You need to call this man. Blunt is the man. So I give the glory to God, and that's thank you for being obedient. Don't ever ask nobody for your gift. Your gift will make room for you. If you feel like you ain't getting enough assignments, maybe you need to do two things. Maybe you need to reevaluate your calling. Or two, maybe you need to reevaluate your relationship. If 
God often does not use us because we have not prepared ourselves to be used. I mean, I've got a pastor to be used. And it's, it's so many things that prepare yourself. You don't study enough. You don't, you're not in the word enough. You don't, you, know, you, you don't discipline yourself enough. How is God going to use you? You ain't learning nothing. You don't come to Bible study. You don't come to get taught. And you wonder why God is not using you? There's some issues in your life you need to fix that you're ignoring. There's so many things. But the greatest thing that God has against us is that we don't have time. God uses Pastor Blunt, not because I'm so spectacular. He uses Pastor Blunt because Pastor Blunt give him time. Man, many of you, 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 you ain't even got time to come to Bible study. You want God to call you to do something? I had a guy told me one day, he said, I feel like the Lord is calling me to preach right up. I said, he is. Now, when he calls you to come to church, and when he calls you to come to Bible study, and when he calls you to come to prayer meeting, then you call me. Because he need to call you there first. His plans are always bigger than our plans, man. I think about Mary and Joseph. All Mary and Joseph want to do is get married, have some kids, and have a great family. But God had a bigger plan. They didn't realize that God had a plan to use them to bless the entire world. God made it for a purpose, man. He always has a bigger plan. God has a greater plan for you. Now, I want you to understand. How many of you want to be great? How many of you want to be great? Okay, nothing wrong with being great. I mean, nothing wrong with being great. Y'all don't want to be great, okay? But I want to warn you about greatness, okay? When God has a greater plan, it's always a harder plan. God's plan is not going to be easy. It's going to come with difficulty. It's going to come with trouble. It's going to come with confusion because his plan is not our plan. It's going to come so hard that human nature is going to try to teach you to take an easy way out. And God does this because he uses difficulties in our life to build our character. He used the difficult in our lives to get our attention. A good parent knows one thing. If you give a kid everything he wants, you'll spoil him. You got to make some things difficult. Amen? The only way you're going to get no more difficult is in heaven. These kids are spoiled today because they don't know anything about difficulties. Because you hand them everything. You understand? Oh, my God. Our characters develop through difficulties. <laughs> you think about it, man. God had a plan for Mary and Joseph, but I wouldn't want to be Mary and Joseph. He had a plan for Mary and Joseph. You think it was easy? Can you imagine the gossip that they had to face by her being an unwed mother? <laughs> you think it was easy riding a donkey for nine months? You think it was easy to deliver a baby in a stable? Yourself? It's amazing. God's plan is always more difficult. But then, then I'm going to say this to you, because I know, you know, I'm going through difficulties in my life. I go, you're going through some difficulties in your life, and it's okay. It's okay. But I understand that difficulty have a limited ministry. And what happened is we make difficulty greater than what it is. There's some things when you are in the kingdom, Bridget, that difficulties cannot do. I'm going to give you a short list. Difficulties cannot cripple love. Difficulties cannot cripple love. If you got love in your heart, got God's love in your heart, that doesn't change. Difficulties cannot shatter hope. Difficulties cannot corrode your faith. 
Difficulties cannot destroy your peace. Difficulties cannot kill true friendships. Difficulties cannot suppress your memories. Difficulties cannot silence your courage. Difficulties cannot invade your soul. And difficulties cannot steal eternal life. It's the thing. God's plan is always more rewarding than any other plan in life. First Corinthians 2 9. God's plan is always more rewarding than anything in your life. Because God will give you things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man. See, God wants to add significance to your life and satisfaction that nothing else can really add. You can't even think of the things that God has in store for you. Amen? When Mary and Joseph switched to God's plan because God had a better plan, wasn't an easy plan, wasn't a plan without problems, but a bigger plan, was a greater plan beyond that they could ever imagine. So if you're going through tough times, difficult times, even through these difficulties, God is still working out his plan in your life. He's still working out his plan in your life. Amen. When God messes up our plan, he wants us to trust him. Can you imagine being Joseph? Your fiance come to you talking about she pregnant. And you ain't ever touched her. And then she go claim ain't nobody else touched her. Can you imagine Mary's faith being a teenager? God does things in our lives that don't make sense because he's simply testing our faith. He wants us to express and develop our faith. When we commit our lives to fulfilling his purpose in our lives, don't worry about the difficulties because it's all going to come together for his good, for our good and for his glory. No matter what you're going through right now, remember God has a plan. Remember, God has a purpose for our life. Trust in God. That's what it's all about. So what you going to do when my life don't make sense? You just keep seeking God. You just keep seeking your focus on him. So I stand here today to challenge you, each and every one of you to hear. When God messes your plan, it's because he's trying to build your character. Because image it's more important than him and anything else. His plans is bigger. His plans are greater. But his plans are also more rewarding. So keep your focus. Stand in faith. Remember this, I find this out in my life. You don't have to figure it out because God already got it worked out. Give God praise and glory. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, listen to this to our virtual audience today. We want to make sure those are looking at us on YouTube and Facebook, GYZ app. And for some reason that you don't know Jesus Christ in the part of your sins, we want you to know uh, that he is available to you. Amen. The good thing about God that I love about God and I love about Jesus, he says, whosoever will, no matter who it is. Peter talks about it is not the will of God that any should perish, that everybody should come into the knowledge of him. So there's no reason for anybody to go to hell. There's no reason for anybody to live this life without Christ. So if you're here and you're not quite sure where you are with your faith right now, give us a call at our church, 706-724-1720. I promise you, you leave a message, we'll have a minister call you and they'll talk with you. Whether you want to accept Christ, whether you want to join our fellowship, uh, you, every believer needs to be a part of a spiritual family. God wants a spiritual family. So every believer ought to be a part of a spiritual family. Or if you just need prayer, you know, they'll, they'll pray for you as well. If you don't want to call, text us, 706-916-6116 if you need prayer. Uh, if you need to accept Christ, text accept. Uh, if you need to join our church, just text join, and they would be able to call you and be able to 
talk to you about that. Amen? May God bless you. I mean, that's what God will do. I want to remind you again, we're getting ready in May. I'm putting a new series together for Pastor's Appreciation. But we're getting ready in May, and we're going to be uh, celebrating 41 years. Uh, Brotherhood Ministry will be doing a banquet. And that banquet's going to be on May 17th, and it's going to start at 6 o'clock. Uh, we ask you to get your tickets early. Get your tickets early. Uh, also, with your tickets, you need instructions on how to get on Fort Gordon, because that is so important. Amen. We don't want you to get disappointed. Uh, so we'll be able to get instruction how to get on Fort Gordon. Amen. Now, if you don't kill somebody last week or got a major felony on there, I can tell you right now, don't buy a ticket because you're not going to be able to get on Fort Gordon. But we want you to know um, how, that we want you there. We want to have a great time. We got a great time coming party with the pastor. Amen. We want you to actually be a part of that. Amen. Now, this coming Sunday at 3 o'clock, I'm on regular morning worship at 9, and this comes Sunday. Now, we're going to be talking about Sunday, um, how God uses your pain to benefit other people. How God uses your pain to actually benefit other people. And we're going to give you some keys and some things that you need to learn how your pain is beneficial. Amen? We're going to learn that. But at 3 o'clock, we are on Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3. And we're going to be sharing that with you at um, on this coming Sunday at 3 o'clock. Amen? At 3 o'clock. So I want you to keep that in mind. Intercessory prayer, again, we are interceding on behalf of all of our medical people, doctors, nurses, uh, medical folk, people who risk their lives to save lives. We are interceding for you. We're interceding for those of are in our educational system, our, our principals, our, our superintendent, our board of education, our teachers, our children, our, our parents. We're interceding for you as well. We're interceding for our first responders who take care of our properties and our lives. And those are dispatchers who dispatch as well as our police and firemen. And we surely, surely ought to be in deep prayer for the leaders of this, of, uh, whether they're local, uh, or not, or, or state, or national. We want you to be interceding and praying for them. So it's very important that we keep these things in mind. Let's all stand as we get ready to be dismissed on the day. God bless you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Amen. And it's good to be seen. Oh, my God. Amen. I'd rather be seen than viewed. Okay, all right, all right, all right. God, I want to thank you for the word today. We want to thank you for the food and you're about to receive and the fellowship you let us share with each other. Send us home safely to our homes and our destinations. And God, we continue to give you the glory and the honor that belongs to you. We give it all to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. God bless you.